curious minds, I'm Dr. Becky, welcome back to my channel. And today I wanna to talk about something called Hoag's Object. Now I mentioned this thing in passing on one of Brady's channel's Deep Sky videos a couple of months ago uh, when I was talking about inner ring galaxies. And I said, oh, this is nothing like Hoag's Object, which has this big massive ring. And um, we showed a video of it in the video and there were all these comments that were like, whoa, 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 like what is that? That looks amazing, tell me more about that. Um, and it's not a Messier object, so it kind of falls out of the remit of Deep Sky videos, but I figured why not talk about it on here because it is a really, really cool object. So this is Hoag's object. Um, it's a galaxy, so a city of stars, like our own Milky Way, but 600 billion light years away. Um, and you'll see it's formed of like two distinct parts, right? It's got the central sort of elliptical blobish component that's kind of like red and dead. It's like not forming stars anymore. And then you've got this outer ring component that's very, very bright, blue, star forming, lots of new star formation. You can see these little clumps all around. The really cool thing is that they're very distinct components. Like there is a very clear gap between that central sort of core of the galaxy and then this really bright ring around the outside. So when it was discovered back in 1950, people didn't actually know that it was a galaxy. Like it looked so weird from other galaxies that we'd seen of these beautiful spiral shapes or just plain ellipticals. And so in the sort of discovery paper, um, Hogue originally said it's probably a planetary nebula. So uh, a star, like a new form star that's forming planets or it's maybe even what we call a gravitational lens. So that's when you get um, a foreground galaxy that's usually like something incredibly massive. So those are the elliptical galaxies that acts as a gravitational lens to magnify a background galaxy, which probably is forming stars and it'll look blue and you get what's called an Einstein ring around it. And so in very early imaging of this galaxy, that's what we thought the blue ring was because we didn't have detailed enough imaging or detailed enough observations to be able to say, is the ring at the same distance as that central core of the galaxy or not? And so it wasn't until like 1987 that someone actually confirmed that that ring is actually um, the same distance away as the central core and therefore it is actually one galaxy in itself rather than like two separate objects. So that was confirmed with a redshift or a spectra and then better imaging showed that actually that cannot be a gravitational ring. Gravitational rings are from really distant objects, so they're incredibly smooth structures. You don't see a lot of detail. Whereas this, you can see the individual clumps of star formation in. So it clearly is a very distinct structure in itself. It's not something that is a background galaxy that's been lensed into the shape of a ring. It is actually a structure that is the shape of an actual ring. So these kind of galaxies are incredibly rare. We think, you know, like less than 0.1% of galaxies are these ring-like galaxies. So there's NGC 1291 and PGC 1714 that have been seen like this as well. So ironically, considering the fact that these things are incredibly, incredibly rare, there is actually another ring galaxy in this image uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope that we have of the Hoag's object, which is sort of at the one o'clock position just up here. It's this tiny ring galaxy in itself that's very, very distant compared to Hoag's object. So really, really cosmic coincidence that the fact that the two ring structures actually line up considering how rare these things are. Now there's another class of object that we do consider rings as well. They're called polar ring galaxies but they differ massively from Hoag's object because they're actually, you can see that they're formed from these train wreck mergers of galaxies where two galaxies come together and the gravitational forces in the interaction or the collision of the galaxies just means that structure gets torn apart and you end up creating this sort of ring-like structure that's sort of a tidal stripping of the gas in a galaxy around the other galaxy in that you form this polar ring structure. And those things are also very rare because you have to have a certain angle of incidence that two galaxies have to come in at in the collision to actually form one of these rings. But you can see when you look at images of these polar ring galaxies that they have been caused by these drastically catastrophic events where gravity is gonna tear them apart and they're sort of disordered and they're sort of sloppy and all over the place. Whereas Hoag's object, you can see it's so structured and even as if some calm, wonderful process has actually formed it. So just to give you an idea of scale of this thing, the inner core of the galaxy is about 17 light years across. The inner ring is about 75 light years across. And then the outer edge of the ring is 125 light years across. So the actual gap, that sort of really distinct empty space is actually broader than the ring itself. 
And if we think about that in terms of scale of our own Milky Way, our own Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. So it's about 25% bigger than the Milky Way. So this is a huge galaxy. And the thing is, we have absolutely no idea how this thing formed. So the polar ring galaxies, where those rings are going over the poles and you can clearly tell that some catastrophic process has formed it. Like we very fully agree on the fact that there was clearly a merger here and that's what formed these objects. But for something like Hoag's object, where you can see that it's nice and settled and sort of some calm process has formed it, there's no accepted theory for how this thing has formed. There's always something wrong with a proposed theory. And so we've never really come across one that's sort of been accepted as the general theory for how these beautifully ordered ring galaxies have formed. So one of the first theories to actually try and explain what had happened in Hoag's object was um, from 1985. And so the theory was that it was actually a transition stage for barred galaxies. So galaxies with these really strong, like linear features running through the center that spiral arms sort of come out of the ends of. And so the idea was that a bar would sort of process through the galaxy and rotate round. It would push gas into the outskirts and form this sort of ring structure. And that would trigger star formation out in the outskirts as you push more and more gas outwards. Then the bar itself would dissipate. So the stars and gas in the bar would somehow either progress outwards or even sink into the center, into that sort of elliptical shape in the middle, the spherical sort of blob. And then you would be left with the blob and the ring, and you would be left with something that had had recent star formation in the outskirts of the ring, whereas all the sort of old and dead stars had sank to the middle, which is what you see in Hoag's object. The thing is, in that scenario, you would expect that the thing in the center wouldn't be beautifully round like it is in Hoag's object. You would get something that was sort of squashed and oval shaped from the fact that you still had some sort of reflection that there used to be that sort of linear structure running through the center. And so you would get that sort of oval shape, which is not what you see in Hoag's object. And then also the kinematics, when you look at the speed of the stars as well, that didn't support the idea that a bar had funneled in the stars into the center either. And so that theory was sort of dismissed pretty quickly. Then in 1987, there was another theory proposed that went back to this idea of a merger or an accretion event that could have formed the ring, but not in it as a like drastic as a way as um, say the polar ring objects. So this theory said, what if the elliptical galaxy in the center had like a minor merger rather than a major merger? So a minor merger being something where you have a massive galaxy and something like piddly comes along. A major merger is where you have a massive galaxy and another massive galaxy comes along. And so they're sort of gonna be fighting for the sort of gravitational dominance in that merger. Whereas if you have a minor merger where only something little comes along, this one's this massive one in the center is clearly going to win out. So the idea is you would have the smaller galaxy come in into the sort of gravitational influence of the larger galaxy and it would slowly get um, stripped and, and sort of torn apart into a slow ring if it had come in at exactly sort of the right angle and uh, of incidence onto the other galaxy. Astronomers also tried to measure the gas mass in that ring-like structure around the outside. So the hydrogen gas that you need to form stars, they said, how much is there? And it turns out there's more there in that ring than there is in the entire Milky Way. And so it is not possible to have gotten that much stellar or gas mass into a system like that from a dwarf galaxy or from a very small galaxy, because you would need something that was as big or if not bigger as the Milky Way to actually get that much gas mass into that kind of structure. So that ruled out that theory as well. Then back in 2011, another group of authors tried to look at this. So they took more observations, they tried to get the kinematics of the actual structures themselves as well and tried to figure out what was going on. And they proposed a new hypothesis that said that the two components had actually formed separately despite now being one object. And so first of all, they looked at how the core could have formed. Now, Hoag's object is actually in a very, what we call low density environment. It's not got a lot of galaxies around it. It's not in a group or a cluster. It's very, very isolated. So the nearest galaxy to it is actually 10 million light years away. Now compare that with the Milky Way, Andromeda, which is our biggest nearest neighbor, you know, you've got the small and large Magellanic clouds around it as well, which are much closer, but Andromeda is two and a half million light years away. So it's very, very isolated. There's nothing around it that's going to affect 
its structure in a couple of billion years or interact with it gravitationally. So because it's so isolated, that's weird that it would have an elliptical galaxy at the center. Elliptical galaxies tend to be found in places where you are gonna have a lot of mergers because you destroy spiral structure in mergers and you sink everything to the center and you form these big spherical shapes. So one idea is that it could be the sort of fossil or remnant of a group and cluster of galaxies that have all sank together and eventually merged and you're left with just this one elliptical and it's sort of the fossil of what used to be there. But these authors also suggest that you could actually form this elliptical galaxy just from pure dissipation or collapse of the stars into this smooth spherical structure as well because it is quite small relative to the big ellipticals that we generally tend to know. Then they said the ring could then form by itself around that spherical structure if you had very slow accretion of just the intergalactic medium. So if there is gas that is sort of still where those galaxies used to be in a, in a group or cluster that used to exist before the old galaxies merged together to form that central elliptical, then that gas could slowly be accreted around that spherical object and possibly start star forming and form this ring. Now that theory doesn't actually cover why they would a form a ring rather than forming like a disc, a, just like a pure disc around that spherical center, like we see in many other galaxies where you have that sort of central bulge and then the flat disc around it. So it had some points lacking in that theory. So actually very recently, back in February 2018, Elena Banakova actually analyzed the motions of sort of particles in the potential of Hoag's object. So looked at it very theoretically with a lot of maths to say what actually would the orbits look like around this kind of structure. So they found that if you take that central spherical component and then you take the ring around it as well, and you say, where do the forces between the two objects balance, the gravitational forces? Then you actually find that that is on the very inner part of the ring of Hoag's object. And then they said, okay, well, where is also the last stable circular orbit around that central spherical structure as well? Um, so that comes from obviously, you know, where can the uh, stars be actually held in a circular orbit without being thrown off their orbits because they're too far away from that central um, structure or they get too close to the ring and then they're disturbed. And so they actually found that that um, last sort of stable circular orbit is within the radius of that ring-like structure in Hoag's object. And so what you're going to end up with is this gap where circular orbits around that central component are just not possible. They're just impossible to have something there. And so you're gonna end up with this sort of mass gap where no stars or even gas particles are actually allowed to orbit because you have something around that central component. So that sort of analytical look at it doesn't actually answer uh, how the ring came to be, all it tells us is why you have that very distinct gap in Hoag's object. But if you combine it with that previous theory of back in 2011, of the fact that you might be able to have accretion of gas onto that spherical structure from the intergalactic medium, perhaps where a group or a cluster of galaxies used to be before they all merged to form that central elliptical, then perhaps you actually might be able to form this ring. Then it makes sense as to why you might have gotten this ring. If stuff started to build up there, then the orbits would become more and more unstable around the central circular object until you had this very ordered ring shape with this very clear gap. So not all the answers are there yet, but we have a better idea at least than we did 30 years ago. Um, but still kind of unsolved. No one yet is in agreement of the idea of the accretion and then the stable circular orbits that prevent you forming a disk and sort of give you that ring. But more observations and more simulations will be able to tell us more about this object. It still is one of these unsolved mysteries. So that's all I've got time to go through this week because Strictly Come Dancing is literally just about to start and I cannot miss it. So until next week, Dr. B, over and out.